Welcome, friends. Can you all hear me? No. Those who cannot hear me, please raise your hand. <laughs> Welcome, friends, to this uh, Bandara. Uh, we are celebrating the Bandara of my master, great master, Azur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh Ji. He transformed the lives of many people. I am one of them. As a disciple of that master, I underwent a lot of changes in my own life, in my attitude towards things, in my experiences of people, experiences of life. And I noticed from my friends who were also initiated by him that they all underwent big changes in their life. It was a transformation for the better in the sense that some things that bothered us a lot, like getting angry at every little thing, that disappeared. Their attachment to everything disappeared. Instead of attachment to things and people, we began to feel love for people, love for things, love for the life, love for world. Big transformation in our attitudes. So, I have come here to share with you some of these experiences that we have when we find a perfect living master like great master Hazur Maharaj Baba Zawal Singh Ji. I am not going to be preaching anything. I am not a preacher. I didn't want to preach ever to anybody. I didn't want to listen to preachers myself. So that's why there is no question of preaching to anybody when I don't like it myself. But when you find that you have an experience with another human being, an ordinary human being, a human being who is just like ourselves, who lives life just like ourselves, who gets, is born like us, dies like us, gets sick like us, gets medicines for treatment like us, eats food like us. There is no difference in the life of that person and yet that person can have such a big effect on other people. The difference between a perfect living master and ourselves is nothing in the life that we lead. It's only in the awareness that that person has. A perfect living master has an awareness which is total, which means he knows exactly the way this creation took place, the purpose of this creation, the purpose of so many of us being here, the purpose of human life and the levels at which different experiences can be obtained which look like reality. We are right now only conscious of one reality, the physical reality, the material reality in which we live. This is not the only reality. There are so many realities. Realities have been created. Sometimes we say it's illusion. It's not correct to say it's illusion because we are experiencing something real. How can we call something illusion when we are experiencing it as real? So long as the experience is real, it looks real, feels real, is real. So it is not correct to say that the creator created real illusions, he created realities. But the fact that they were created and were not already there, to that extent you can say, that it was not real in the real sense because it was created. It was not a permanent thing. If there was something permanent, we could call it real. Anything that changes cannot be really called truly real because what changes means it did not exist at a certain time in that form. This world in which we live is changing constantly. Nothing is the same ever, neither our lives nor the universe, nor the galaxies moving around us, nor the atoms or the molecules or the neurons, nothing is permanent. They are all changing. This changing universe cannot be called real in that sense. There are other planes of experience, which when we go into those planes, they look equally real. There is an astral plane. An astral plane is nothing more than a plane of experience where we can use our sense perceptions without using our body. It's not something very unusual. 
people talk of astral plane as if something lying somewhere else. It's right here. It's only if you could be experiencing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, if you could experience these things without the body, that's astral plane. It's right here. We are using it right now, but we are using it with a physical body. If we could use it without a physical body, it will become an astral plane. But it will be a bigger reality, it looks like so real. And we wonder how we thought that the physical material world was the only reality. So we can have an experience sitting right here. And that experience is not taking place anywhere else. It's taking place right here. In fact, you will find that the word here is very important. The two words that enlightened people have realized. One is here. There is no here. There is no there at all. There is only here. Second is now. There is no other time except now. Have you ever considered that any time, any moment that you are living, you are in now? Has anybody ever lived in any time other than now? Never. This now and here are permanent. And all others are created around it. All other experiences are created around it. The astral experience of sensory perceptions, which we can all have by very simple method. The simple method is become unaware of your physical body. Why do I call it simple? Because we all do it in a different way every night when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, we are not aware of our body. So it's a natural process. A natural process of sleeping leads to our becoming unaware of our body as yet we see things in dreams, we move around and we take the dream to be real because we are not aware of our physical body. And the dream is real so long as we are dreaming. The moment we wake up, it becomes unreal. It is just an experience. The same thing is true of the physical experience also. So long as we are in the physical body, this is our reality. We have no other reality. All other is conjecture, philosophy, speculation. But once we are out of this physical body and still alive to use our senses, then we discover we have woken up to another level of reality. And that is possible because we are used to sleeping and getting away from body. And this time we can by practice, become unaware of our body. And the practice is very simple. The practice is to withdraw our attention. And I'm emphasizing the word withdraw our attention from the physical body to ourself. Who is ourself? If you think the physical body is ourself, this will remain the physical reality. If you think there is something else inside us, which makes us talk, which makes us think, which makes us alive. If the conscious experience we are having is coming from some part of ourself, which is within ourself, and we put attention on that, that means we draw attention from the outside experience, we draw attention from the body, and put our attention in the head, behind the eyes, from where we are looking at the world, where we are thinking from, where we are conscious that we are alive from. If we can do that, gradually we become unaware of the body and an astral world opens up. It's very simple. It is difficult because of our attachments, because of our great conviction that this world is the only reality. Because at this time it does look like the only reality. In fact, not only looks like, it is the only reality. We have nothing else to compare with. So that is why it so becomes difficult. A very simple thing has become difficult because we have taken this as reality, ultimate reality, only reality, and we cannot pull ourselves out. These enlightened people, these perfect living masters, they come to tell us a very simple message. They say, this may be a reality for you at this time, but this is not your true home. You don't belong here. The rules of governing this reality are not the ones to which you are accustomed in your own original self. Your own original self is full of love, 
beauty, joy, bliss. That's your original state. There is no such thing as duality in your original state. There is no pain and suffering in your original state. There is no pair of opposites in your original state. Therefore, when you are in this experience, it's only for the sake of experience you came here. This is not your true home. Your true home is from where all these realities have been created. And to go back to your true home, you can find the way which is lying right within yourself. There is nothing outside that you can find looking for true home. Outside is a projection from your true self. The true self consists of consciousness. Consciousness is a strange word. I sometimes find when I talk to people, they have very different interpretations of the word consciousness. That they think that just being aware of something is being conscious of that thing. They don't distinguish between awareness and consciousness, thinking it's the same thing. But the way I understand consciousness, and as the great master explained to me, consciousness is the potential and ability to be conscious of anything, to be aware of anything. It's a power. It's a creative power. It's such a strong power. If you can be conscious of anything, you can create anything. You can create any kinds of worlds you like, any kinds of realities you like. You can create infinite types of things. That is the power of consciousness and we are in our reality consciousness. So that's amazing that in our reality we have that great power. And here we are thinking that we are merely human beings trapped in a little body and we have to live our life according to our karma, according to our destinies. What a strange situation we are in that we do not know anything about our real self. And the real self, where is it? Inside us, nowhere outside. It's the is the real thing is what is making us alive right here. Because we are conscious and aware of this world because of our own conscious self. Therefore, there is nothing outside. Nobody has ever found any reality outside. They go deeper and deeper into illusion of creation. But to find the reality, you can go inside. The message of this masters are very simple. This is not your true home. But if you are tired of this experience for which you came, you came to have an experience. We all are curious. We all like to have experiences. We came to a physical experience. If we want to now go back to our true home, we just have to say to ourselves, I am tired of this experience I have had. I am now fed up. I have had enough of it. I am ready to go. And that experience of saying you are ready to go is called seeking. You have to seek within yourself. If you seek the truth, if you seek your true home, you'll get it. It's as simple as that. Seeking is the key. Whoever seeks will find it. And it depends on what you seek. Supposing you seek a heaven. There are heavens, but not in this physical plane. You can sometimes call uh, paradise. Hawaii is a paradise. You go to the Waikiki beach and people say you come to paradise. There's some nice places here. If, when I was a uh, little younger, I thought Disney World was a paradise. <laughs> They're not a paradise, but there are some real heavens of the type which we read in some literature, some dis people describe. Supposing your seeking is for heaven, you go to heaven. There are several heavens in the astral plane, and if you want to examine, are there really any heavens or not? Follow the simple procedure of withdrawing your attention from the physical body, go into the sensory systems. Sensory systems are capable of going to those heavens and also capable of going to some hells. We sometimes make a hell out of our life right here, but there are worse hells in the astral plane. So the astral plane is not all a great heavenly place. It is something where all kinds of experiences exist, which are not physical, but they can be very extreme. Extreme type of pleasure, extreme types of hurt and pain, and those exist in the astral plane. And they can be actually experienced by anybody by withdrawing attention and going to that state where only senses work and the material body is not there. That is not our true home. That's also duality, pain and pleasure in duality. And not only that, the biggest thing that is holding us down here 
is that we have lost now and gone into time. Now we have disappeared and we live in past, present and future. Now is reality, even here and anywhere. Here and now will always be reality. But we don't live in now and we don't live in here. Our mind is roaming all over. We never are here. There is a song somebody sent me which says, it nahi ta kith nahi. If it is not here, it's nowhere. So here is the only reality. Where is here? Here is where you are experiencing from. Not the experience. Experience divides into past, present and future, into here and now and there. So experiences are taking away the reality. But if you withdraw attention to within yourself, you can reach a state where you can experience here and now in its own true form, which is our true home. And there is no such thing as duality or separation of past from present and future. It's all one timeless moment of total, absolute potential for any kind of creativity, consciousness. That is our true home. It's so different from the experiences we are having here, but that's why we are having experiences, to have something different. But this is, these are time-bound experiences. Nobody in the physical body has ever lived forever. I know perfectly we masters came, very enlightened souls came. We read history about them. They all died. Nobody is living forever. If they were so enlightened, they, they could keep their body alive, they would have been here. Nobody is here. My master, great master, 2nd of April, 1948, left his body like anybody else. I was a homeopathic uh, practitioner along with, a, along with a, another doctor from Switzerland, Dr. Pierre Schmidt. We were treating him for his cancer. He died like anybody else. And yet, we say that he was aware of totality, of everything. And he taught others how to be aware of their own true home and totality. So that is why it's not, we are bound by a time frame in which we cannot retain any one of our forms forever. No form whatsoever, not even an astral form. If we were without a body and disembodied spirit, we still have a time frame. The time frame is not the same as the physical time frame, it's a little longer. It may be instead of a hundred years, average, maybe thousand years, maybe two thousand, three thousand years. Still a time frame. We are born and we die, even there. Even the sensory systems are born and die. Therefore, the trap we are in really is the time factor. The space and time which we are going through to have these experiences is actually the biggest trap. What creates space and time? In our experience, what is creating space and time? Was space and time pre-existing and we came into it? Or are we just experiencing something in space and time? Which is the cause, which is the effect? Very old question. People are saying for many years, when we look at a tree, is the tree there because we are looking at it? Or we are looking at it because it is a real tree there? They were debating this, those who think a tree has to be there before we can look at it, are called materialists. And those who think, no, it's because we can look at the tree and therefore it's there, are called idealists. The debate between the materialist and idealist has been going on for thousands of years. In different forms, different languages, they have been discussing it. That are we creating our universe? Or is the universe created in which we have come for a little experience? And a very common answer is, in cause and effect, whatever comes first is cause, whatever comes later is effect. Therefore, let's find out which comes first. Do we see the tree first and then it comes? Or do we have to place a tree in front then we see it? It's very simple. So the materialists say, yeah, you have to bring a tree in front of you before you can see it. There was the cause. But they don't realize that bringing the tree in front of it is also an experience like the tree. Therefore, maybe you can also bring the experience from inside of moving it there. 
Now, when you examine the timing of the tree and the seeing of the tree, it is identical to the spot. It is simultaneous. There is no gap whatsoever. In the tree and the seeing of the tree, no gap. Therefore, there is no possibility of determining the cause and effect from there. But there is another way of determining what is the cause, what is the effect. And that is, if you are questioning whether seeing the tree is creating the tree, then go back into seeing. Understand what is seeing, why are you seeing? Which of course makes you go back into the body, into the eyes, into the behind the eyes. How do you see? When we look at this possibility of examining how do we see things? Well, common explanation for the materialist is very simple. That objects, people are all around us. When light falls upon them, the light is reflected. And the colors that we see are the ones that are not absorbed. And the ones that are not absorbed are reflected back from light, which is all the color of the rainbow, the spectrum. So that is how those rays of light and near parallel rays come into our eye and there they go inside the eye through the lens and because of the lens they cause a picture, there is the lens inside, there is the aqueous and vitreous humor inside, they are very nice to create an image on the back of the eye where the optic nerve has spread itself out at the retina and containing rods and bones to give us the shape and color and we are able to convey that picture which somehow is upside down. Now we know picture seems to be when picture is seen there you see it's upside down but we see straight. How this happens? No explanation yet. They say just we get used to it. That's the explanation, medical explanation. But anyway that's not the issue. Issue is what happens after that. It's only a picture on the retina. Retina is an extension of the optic nerve. It takes the picture into the brain. And in the brain, in the region where the optic nerve ends, they, we, if we are conscious, we can see. This is a whole process. Now imagine for a moment, if the retina was, has the capacity to make pictures, you were born with a retina with the capacity to make pictures. And some retinas have been born like that. Though they are exception to the rule. We call those people hallucinating. So they can see things and others cannot see. So we say they are hallucinating either from the retina or from the optic nerve or from the brain or consciousness. Now, supposing nothing is happening outside but we are able to have the optic nerve creating that we see things exactly we are seeing. If it's only the brain that is creating the images, we'll see exactly like we are seeing now. If only consciousness was creating it, we still see the, exactly the same way. It's very difficult to pinpoint at which point this sensory perception is coming. If we think that the sensory perception of seeing is only related to the physical eye, we would not be able to see anything in a dream, nor would we be able to imagine anything and visualize it and see it. Which eye looks at things in the dreams? Which eye looks at things when we imagine and make a picture of something in our mind? This definitely, this seeing is not connected only with the physical eye. We are seeing so many things through our imagination, which is not connected with these physical eyes at all. If we begin to examine only this, where is this other eye which can imagine and see things? That, that eye is not outside anywhere, it must be within the body. How do we determine that we have other eyes to see other than the physical eyes? Well, we close these eyes. We close these eyes and see if we can still imagine and see things. We can. We can imagine anything we like and we can see them. Then we realize that we can see things with these eyes closed through imagination. What else can we do with imagination? We can also walk and talk and do a lot of things. When we think, who is talking? In words, our mouth is shut and thoughts are going on in our head and we are talking. Who is talking? 
That means we have a self different than the physical body that it can do these things. Is it just pure imagination, unreal thing that's going on? Or is there some reality to that? We can only answer that question if we become unaware of this system and only use that. If we withdraw our attention behind the eyes to the eyes that are looking through imagination and function with the inner self, which looks imaginary, to the point that we become unaware of the physical body, that will become a reality more real than the physical body, a matter of experience. Anybody can do it. These are not very unusual things that only some people can do it. This is open to anybody to test out that we have a self within this physical self which functions differently, follows different laws of nature than the laws of nature that are governing a physical body and a physical universe. So if we can go to that point, who is that being? Now, here we are talking of something astral, very far away. We don't know where astral life is. No, that is the astral life. Astral world is the world which we think is imaginary right now. It looks imaginary because we take this as real, the rest is all imaginary. You become unaware of this one, that is no longer imaginary. It has many other qualities which this body does not have. It can do certain things this body cannot do. For example, that self can fly. This cannot fly. We need aeroplanes to fly, that can fly on itself. People fly. You can fly any time. Even when you're sitting with me, I'll make you, all of you fly with that body. Everybody can fly with that. But if you are unaware of this body and then fly with it, as a real flight, you will experience as your own true flight, not an imaginary flight. So there are certain things that can be done with that body, which cannot be done with this one. Moreover, the big trap of time-space that is holding us here, that also the rule changes. Here, every moment, the time slips into the past. It's very interesting if you examine the nature of time and space follows from there because time is now and then and then space is here and there but they're both connected together. Now if you look at time here, how do we know there is time? We know it because some things have just happened. I came, I sat on the chair, has gone. I'm still talking to you in the present. I will finish my talk and walk away. This future. Our whole concept of time is bound time, bound by the experience of what we think is past, what we think is present, what we think is future. That's our notion, notion of time. Examine carefully what is past. We can't know what is past except through memory. Our memory can tell what is past. Is there any time in the present? If you look at it very carefully, is there any time at all in the present? The moment I say now, it will become more past. Before I said it, it was future. Is the meeting point of future and past called now? Is it a billionth of a second? No, it's not even a billionth of a nanosecond. It doesn't stop at all. When the future slips into the past, it does not stop even for a billionth of a second. It doesn't stop at all. It just moves. Has anybody ever experienced a now that is a little bit of a second or something? Never. Therefore, there is no present really what we call present. What are we calling present is immediate past. Just to talk now is present. Before I talked, it was future. But there was no real present at all. What we call present was actually past. And what was past is actually past is gone. So past and present are past. What about future? At least there must be a future. There are things that are coming and going to happen. As an experience, there is no future unless we do one of three things. We hope for something or we fear something or we anticipate something. 
these are functions of the mind. We always hope this will happen. We are afraid this will happen. We say this might happen, it will happen tomorrow. Supposing these functions do not take place, there is no future at all. Think of it. Future is merely being created by these functions of ours. And in order to hope, it takes time and is actually taking place in the past. Hope is a time bound thing. Fear is time bound. Anticipation is time bound. The moment you do those things, they are happening in the past. Because it is not stopping when you hope, it takes time. Therefore, it goes into the past. The truth is that what we are really, really experiencing here as past is past. What we think is present is past. What we think is future is also past. And there is no way to experience the past except through memory. Sitting here, it may look very strange to you. But the truth is when you discover the nature of time by going within to the area where time is being created for this, for this experience, you will discover that this life is nothing but reliving of a memory. Because past is only recalled through memory. If past, present and future are all past and recoverable only through memory, that means we are having a very vivid recollection of the memory. Where did we get the memory from? Can't have a memory without any event. Where did the events take place that you could have a memory of it and are living it right here? Events did not take place here. What we are living did not take place here. It looks like it's happening right here because we have no access to the area where it took place. It took place in an area of consciousness that is even higher than the astral plane of consciousness. Astral plane is also governed by the same time, like this one. The only difference being, in astral plane, if you like a particular scene, you can hold a time. You can't hold time here. That's the only difference. But where is it being created? Our destiny, our whole memory of life is being created one step higher. We call it the causal plane. So all things are being caused from there. All experiences, everybody is having, is taking place from the causal region of our consciousness. That causal region of consciousness can be also experienced by us. We can all see it. We can go back and see what's happening there. How do we do it? Same way like we do the astral plane. Now you withdraw your attention even from the inner imaginary body, go behind the eyes of the inner self and you will become unaware of the sensory systems and causal self will open up where you will find that we are different, we are mental beings, that our minds are our identity, that our thoughts are our identity, that's what our life is, our thoughts are our life and the thoughts are generating the rest of it. And where are thoughts coming from? We discover at the top of that great region that we are picking up pre-programmed destinies, pre-programmed capsules of memories, which we call in the physical world our destiny. We are picking it up ourselves. Somebody says, if everything is predetermined, then why should I bother about anything? Well, you, whether you bother about it or not, you, pay, you picked it up. Nobody else did. There is nobody else to pick it up. The whole thing is being created from inside your own self. And you, you don't know it here, but you can know it if you want to. If you want to find out the cause of everything, go to the causal region, you'll find out. Why did you pick up this particular kind of life? Couldn't you pick up something better? Well, you had a big choice. Very big choice. People find that they have life which has pain and pleasure, life which has ups and downs. Every human being I have met has ups and downs. I have not met a single person in my life who says, all my life was just joy and bliss, nor have I met a person who says, all my life was hell, except after marriage some people have said. <laughs> That's a different matter. All I'm saying is that if you want to know why you picked up this, you have to follow what were the rules laid down for different levels of experiences laid out at the causal plane. The rules are different. At the causal plane, the rule is 
that you can be any life form, not necessarily human being. You can be an ant, you can be a bacteria, you can be a bird, you can be a mammal, you can be human, you can be an angel, you can be any life form. In our Indian literature, they have listed 8.4 million types of life forms. And in the last section of 400,000, one life form is called human life. The description to get those life forms is very amazing. Each life form is created by a cause. That means the cause and the life form are built together. You cannot have a life without a cause. And the cause is called previous life. Now that's very strange that we have had no previous life and yet we are going to enter into a destiny which requires previous life. To have any life form. To have a life form of animals, birds, all those, you have, don't have to have very good karma, very good previous lives. But to be angels, to be uh, living in heavens and all, you need a much better life in the past. To be a human being in the midst of this combination, you have to have a combination of high and low in a past life. And that's just a rule. You can go check it out. It's a causal rule we made so that we can create a human life different from all other life life. Why, why was this introduced as rule that to be a human being you have to have ups and downs? Reason was simple. That only in the human being, the mind working in the human being through the brain should have the experience of making choices to be able to decide what to do. Human life was separated from all other life forms because it, out of 8.4 million life, life forms, it was so arranged that if you get tired of these experiences coming from your own true home, you should be able to go back. And the door to go back was opened only in one life form out of all these 8.4 million human life forms. Therefore, the rules were made different. In order to have a feeling that you have a choice to choose between one thing or another, a life had to be created where there were a lot of options. You could say, I can go there or not go there. I can go right or I can go left. That the choices are open, creating an experience which we call free will. That free will was generated as an experience in human life. In order to make free will real, the life had to have ups and downs in order to make choices. Therefore, this was a unique, unique thing that happened in creation. And all the things that I say to you today, or I'll say ever, are verifiable by any one of you by just going to the level of experience where these answers can be found. They are all inside you. All the answers to all these questions are inside you. No, nothing outside. This human life has been created with ups and downs, so we choose. And therefore it's set up like a system of reward and punishment. And that gives birth to the law of karma. The law of karma was born because of this human life having choice. At least it looked like choice. But if it is pre-programmed already, then do we have choice? Of course we have. We picked up the... We picked up the memory packs, capsule ourselves. We made a choice right there. We didn't make the daily choice of thinking what to do in a human life. We picked up a total choice. Why would somebody pick up a choice in which we are having so many ups and downs? Slightly better, we could have had a little better deal. There were many choices. We saw we could have one life followed by other lives based upon the experience of that life, the karma of that life, we could have infinite. And to create that one life, first life which we come here, there has to be so many past lives. Each past life requires another past life. Infinite past lives, infinite future lives is the package that we pick up. The capsule that we pick up, the memory capsule we pick up is not merely memory for one life because the law of cause and effect is being put into it. Therefore, it's a memory package containing infinite past lives which you never lived. 
an infinite future life which you will never look to live. But it's a package in order to justify the events through cause and effect. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to do it. If you are a scientist or, a, or an artist and you go and see this, it's a beautifully done work. I would like somebody to come and suggest improvements in that. I personally, great master told me once, he said, look at what's happening and tell me how you can improve it. And when you saw the grand picture, when you see the grand picture, you can't improve it. It's perfect. And the perfection can only be seen from the top. That's how it was all arranged. Within the creation, it's all imperfect. Within the realm of the mind, all three worlds of causal, astral, and physical are imperfect. Perfection comes from beyond that. But since the life was formed with ups and downs, human life, to create free will, why was free will created? In order to give the experience of seeking. I said earlier, if you seek, you will fight. If you seek to go to your true home, you'll go to your true home. If you seek to go to heaven, you'll go to heaven. If you want to seek to go to Hawaii, you'll also go to Hawaii. You can go wherever you seek. Seeking is the key. Now, seeking can be pure seeking, strong, intense seeking, or it can be seeking mixed with little doubts. I'm seeking, but I'm not sure if it will happen. Then it won't happen. That's another thing. It's a very beautiful gadget that works like this. It's a mental gadget. It says, if you have a doubt, it won't work. And the mind has been placed there to create the doubts. So most of our seeking doesn't work. Because of doubts, it won't happen. Somebody presented to me the book and a movie called The Secret. He said, it, depend, it is saying the law of attraction means that whatever you want to attract to yourself by seeking, it will happen. The only condition is, a very important condition, that you should have no doubt about it. Those people who wrote the books, those people who made the movie, they sought to make millions, they made it. Their, their proposition is very correct. I, I remember uh, a man who advertised once a very small ad in a paper, guaranteed how to make one million dollars. Just send one million with this cutting from the paper and we'll give you the formula for making a million. So people sent, millions of people sent money, one dollar only to get make a million, guaranteed. So the, what the answer was, go and put an ad in the paper, <laughs> same ad, and you make million. The guy who first put up this idea did make million. When you say there is a law of attraction, the doubt is supposed to be something that undo, undoes that seeking. And yet, we have a mind operating in a certain way. It creates two things, doubt and fear. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Mind has been given to us. It's an accessory to ourselves. It's an accessory to consciousness, created by consciousness to help consciousness in having experiences in the three worlds, astral, physical, and causal. So does the mind, which has been given these certain qualities, is being given a function. The mind's function is to think. Think continuously. All the time it must think. If it doesn't think, it will die. Just like if a heart stops beating, we die physically. If the mind stops thinking, it will die. And people sometimes claim that they don't think, but I have proven over and over again that when they say we don't think, they are thinking of not thinking. So a lot of things have been proven. Now, why this thinking machine has been given to us? It's a beautiful thing. I say there is nothing so great. It is better than any computer invented by us. It's like a computer. But it's working so efficiently. This mind works so efficiently through the thought process. It rationalizes, makes sense, uses logic. It's wonderful. We enjoy life with the mind by thinking about it. But the mind also wants to doubt and create fear. The reason why doubt and fear were put into the mind was so we don't get just exploited by others. That we are given, it is a, it's a means of getting caution. 
be cautious and that can only happen if you are given a doubt be careful it may not be like that what you think so so doubt which leads to skepticism is a good thing it's not a bad thing but if you are in doubt all the time then you are overusing that particular feature in mind you can keep on asking questions all the time you heard me telling the story of the philosopher who was visiting a village in india and in the in the village there are wells which have no parapet walls around them and as he was walking he fell into the well fortunately the water was shallow and he didn't drown but he began to moan and groan what happened how, how did he fall into the well a man walking outside the villager heard his moaning and groaning and he came and he said oh i'm sorry you fell into the well i'll go and bring a rope and pull you out he said wait before you bring the rope first tell me why i fell into the well <laughs> secondly tell me that how will i believe that you will bring a rope and just not just telling me thirdly if you do bring a rope how I, how can i be sure that when you leave uh, put the rope in the well that half way when i am trying to climb up you will again drop me down the man said look why don't you come out of the well and then we can discuss why you fell what happened <laughs> he said no first to answer my questions he said okay then you stay in the well <laughs> we are sometimes in that state we want to get our questions answered but we want to have so many questions that we spend our life in questioning only there is a point where we should say okay i have some very fundamental questions i want them to be answered i have my doubts i want to clear them but if i have cleared my doubts up to a point where i say i can take one leap only the first step and then see if the second is there or not that's that's a good judgment good use of the mind but if we are using the mind only for questioning we can be wasting our entire life in questioning only so there are some good things the mind can be a very useful device it is a very useful device i think it's one of the most wonderful things given to us our mind but the mind can also create a big problem for us through doubt and through fear the problem is that doubt leads to fear the fear then makes us insecure and when i meet my friends and see their insecurities in life created by the mind then i find such a useful thing has been applied so differently to create insecurity rather than to use it to for good judgment the reason is that we have not properly learned how to use this equipment if somebody gave me a very advanced computer and don't know how to work it it's useless for me the mind has been given to us as a beautiful wonderful computer but we don't know how to use it properly the mind has great artificial intelligence and talks to us through thoughts advises us what to do the mind advises us and if we give it full liberty to advise whatever it likes it advises something for its own survival mind is not a being mind is not life mind is not soul we are souls we are life we are consciousness mind is not mind is using our consciousness to function we are giving mind our life to function and yet the mind starts behaving like it is independent and can talk to us and give us advice when we begin to take the advice of the mind we are in trouble when we tell the mind what to do it's wonderful that's the only only piece we are missing that the mind was not given to us to take advice from the mind was given to us to be used that means use the ability of the mind to think to sense to do, use logic to rationalize to do things but do not use the mind to take advice what to do then where should the advice come from advice should come from your own self does the self have its own voice of course it does the self is not dependent for its voice or its will only on the mind remember there is a mental will and a spiritual will in us the mental will comes from the mind the spiritual will comes from the spirit the spirit is our soul 
the difference between the two is one functions in time which is created by the mind one functions without time the spiritual will does not require time to function the mind always requires time to function the mind works through thought the spiritual world works through intuition intuition you must know what is intuition intuition is knowing something knowing what to do without thinking about it that's intuition it comes spontaneously without time and we know it's called gut feeling sometimes gut feeling we know the gut feeling what is to be done but we ignore that and give preference to what the mind is telling us i'm giving you a simple example today that you live one week your decisions based upon the gut feeling you get and use a mind to carry it out instead of the mind telling you what to do and then trying to do it and next day saying oh i'm sorry it wasn't the right thing your life will change in one week then the mental will is not supposed to be guiding us it's supposed to be useful to ca- carry out our life to do things so if we develop our spiritual will and intuitive will and tell the mind what to do mind is very useful he will do great job for you how do you develop spiritual will we don't have any knowledge even of our spirit we don't even have knowledge of soul some people don't even believe there is a soul they are mixing up the mind and soul as one thing when i first came to this country united states and people discussed in the university where i was studying and the professors would say you know mind soul whatever you like to say i said they are not the same thing soul is the life life consciousness that's making everything alive including the mind including the thinking process and does not operate in time and mind is very limited to operating only in time how can you mix the two together the spiritual will is our own will of the soul and that should pre- prevail over the mind's will since we don't even know where our soul is we we say i think that's for that's me no that's not me that's that's a mind is being empowered by me to be able to say uh, that's me is being empowered by the soul to think it does not mean that it becomes ourself this is a this is a truth that is not learned very easily but can be learned very easily if you go beyond the mind if you can go to a state of being a state of your own conscious living experience of being beyond the mind where the mind is left behind like the body can be left behind through meditation and going to the astral plane you can go beyond the mind when you go beyond the mind you understand these things completely and this is possible that's one of the fundamental teachings of great master baba savan singh he said my teaching actually starts from beyond the causal plane it starts from a discovery that we are not the body not the mind not the senses we are the soul that's the beginning of our journey to discover the soul where does the end end take place we will find there are not many souls there is only one soul from where all the many are coming that's the real spiritual journey from the individual soul to totality of consciousness is only one that's the spiritual journey that he taught so therefore we can reach that point of course to go beyond the mind you need a different process i must tell you that this whole business of developing a spiritual will and going beyond the mind does not take place easily because no effort can help us in that all effort when we say i'm trying to do something i'm struggling to do something it's all mental effort itself is mental every effort soul never makes effort soul has no effort but the mind makes effort and so long as you're trying to make an effort you're in the mind yes doing a mind's work and you're relying on the mind to be the self therefore to go beyond the mind effort does not work then something else must work what is the secret of the teaching of great master that there is something that can take you beyond the mind without effort it is that which pulls us even right here without effort and that's called 
love. L O V E, love. When we fall in love with somebody, no effort, it just comes. When we fall in love, we are pulled. We don't push, we don't make effort. The same love takes us beyond the mind. Nothing else has ever taken anybody beyond the mind that I can know of without the pull of love of something that was beyond the mind. Therefore, we have to be pulled by the love of something that is beyond the mind. Otherwise, how are we pulled beyond the mind? Perfect living masters are human beings with awareness and consciousness of that which is beyond the mind. Therefore, when we come in association with them, a strange kind of love pulls us, which we can't understand for a while. But that love that pulls us is actually pulling us beyond the mind because they are operating from beyond the mind. That's the big difference between a teacher and a perfect living master. A perfect living master is not a teacher. Teaching is all mental. A perfect living master does not come here to teach anything. He comes to pull us with the love. And that love is coming flowing, even in the human being. Well, the human being has that awareness. The love is flowing from beyond the mind, from the spiritual region. And therefore, it's that love that pulls us. Up to the causal plane, you can do meditation. You can do various kinds of effort, put in efforts and struggles and reach that experience momentarily or for a longer period. Many kinds of yogas exist to take you to those experiences. But that which pulls you beyond that is only that which is love. Therefore, the true meditation for going beyond the mind is meditation with love and devotion. Without love and devotion, nobody is gone there. Meditation by itself has not taken anybody beyond the mind. But love and devotion has. So why am I using two words now? I was using love and also suddenly I brought devotion also. What is love and devotion? Love is what pulls. Devotion is experience of being pulled. We become a devotee when we are pulled by that love. And devotion is an automatic response to love. We have in our own lives as human beings mixed up attachments and love. We think attachments are love. We are attached to something, we love that thing. We love our house, we love our pets, we love our cats, dogs, we love human beings, we love children, we love everybody around. None of that is really love, it's all attachment. How do we distinguish between actual love and attachment? Actually, distinction is not difficult. You will notice when we are attached to something, we are conscious of ourselves and to whom we are attached. I love my daughter. I love my wife. I love so and so. I and that person. I and that thing. Two. Always two. In attachment, you are always conscious of your separate mental self and to what you are attached. In love, you forget yourself. Only the beloved is thought of. What happens to yourself? The self is placed in the back bench. I have not seen any experience in life which puts the ego or the I-ness of a person at the back except love. When you fall in love with somebody, you forget talking about I, you think of the beloved. And that's love. In love you forget that. A true devotee forgets his devotee and is only thinking of the beloved. And that is why this kind of relationship is the true relationship on the spiritual path that a disciple of a perfect living master is in love with the master. The master's love comes in such a strong way that the devotee can't help it and is being put. That's what happens. The mind creates doubt. The mind creates obstacles. But the love is strong, if it's a perfect living master, love is strong to override even all those doubts in course of time. So this is the experience. It's a path of love and devotion. Then why do these perfect living masters say, do meditation? Why do they say, two and a half hours? Why do they say, hear the sound, repeat the words? Why are they telling those things? If the secret is only love and devotion, 
because the mind will not understand any love and devotion except these instructions. Therefore, they say, follow the instructions. Try hard. And people try hard. When they try hard, what happens? They fail. Then they say, we tried very hard. It doesn't work. Very good. I, I remember the story of the one, the Riyai a great disciple of that master, written the books also. And he was a very accomplished uh, civil servant and a judge, judicial guy in Kapurthala state near the Dera in India. And he retired from his job. He was very fond of great master and went to great master and he said, I've retired from my job and I want to now serve you. I know seva is very good. You sometimes hint that seva is as good as meditation and I think it's a shortcut. So I rather do seva than do meditation. So can you give me some? He said, uh, Devan Dariyalal, you are a very highly educated person. You can do anything. You can be secretary of our organization. You can be president of our organization. You can take on any job. You can run the library. There are so many jobs, intellectual jobs you can do here. He said, no, sir. All I want is to be your doorman. I want to stand outside your door. He's okay. So be it. So for the rest of his life, he stood outside the door. He enjoyed the job because he saw such wonderful disciples come to great master. And they were so full of love in their eyes. And he would look at them, inspiring to see how people can be so changed by one man like that. He enjoyed that. After some years of that beautiful seva of standing as a doorman, he went to great master and he said, Master, it just suddenly occurred to me that while I'm enjoying this seva, enjoying the service of standing out your door, but I also have missed out on inner experiences that people say only you get by meditation. So I am sorry I missed meditation and I want to catch up with that now. And I understand that this year you are not going to the hill station where you go in the summer, which is called Dalhousie. And can I have the keys of your house so I can spend a few months, three months only in meditation and catch up for all the lost time? That master said, here is the key, go. He took the key, it was so wonderful to go and stay in great master's house in the hills in good weather and meditate every day, 24-7. That was his plan. When he reached that house and he opened the door, a man came running. He says, I am the plumber. I have been waiting for somebody to come so I can do some work. So plumber comes. Somebody else comes in. There is so much disturbance. Every day there is disturbance. He couldn't meditate at all. After three months, he comes back, returns the key to get master and says, Master, I failed. I couldn't do any meditation. That master laughed and said, No, the Rehaisal, you passed. You passed and found that your effort will not do anything. And you, the mind thinks it will do. The mind needs to know after experiencing effort that effort is not the answer. The mind will not accept this before making the effort. The mind will say, I have to put in. Why will the mind say? Because nothing else is achieved in this life, in the physical world, without effort. Therefore, the mind puts the same principle that to get something spiritual, I must put in my best effort. And therefore, it does put in its best effort. And then it fails, because effort is not the answer. Effort can give you some experiences, but they will never be satisfied. The soul is never satisfied. Mind can be sometimes satisfied with some things. Soul is never satisfied except when it reaches its true home and discovers itself. That is why it is so important to understand that this is a path of love and devotion. I have come here to share with you that this experience of a perfect living master, the experience of love and devotion, is generated in such a beautiful way. Master is a human being. We are human beings. We are disciples of that master. And the master functions like a human being, like a friend. I have watched great master. Little children came to him. I was also a child. I also went to him as a child. He became a child. 
I have seen very big intellectuals, professors, barristers coming from England, trying to discuss things with him with an air of authority that the mind can solve all problems and how he's talked to them at the intellectual level. I have seen him talk to poor people like he's a poor man himself. He could adjust himself to his disciples and make them feel that he's a personal friend of theirs. A feeling that could not be created by any kind of conversation. But the feeling was created in those people. And I knew what was going on. He was creating love and devotion. He was giving them a love which they may not have understood but experienced. The mind would not understand but experienced it. I have seen this with my own eyes. How the great master operated. This is what I wanted to share with you. That this is the path of love and devotion. Try your best. Satisfy the mind that you have done your best. And don't worry about the failures of the mind. You are still succeeding in your soul, in your love. Love does not go away easily. A perfect living master's love is amazing. People came to great master and said, Master, I don't believe anything that you say. But I love you. Okay. One day you will believe in what I am saying. No, Master. It's impossible. Possible. There was a doctor, a lady doctor. She was in Kapurthala, Dr. Shakuntala. I remember that incident. I happened to be there when this incident happened. And she loved the great master, but never believed any of his teachings. She said she has been trained in medical sciences in a modern scientific way. And she can't believe this, all this stuff about there being other worlds and other levels of awareness and all. It's all made up. She says it's all made up stuff. And there is no proof of it. And we scientific people like to have empirical proof. It should be proved according to our standards, which means it should be repeatable, it should be open to everybody, and there should be confirmation from different peers of the same thing. It should happen all like that according to our science. And this is what the master is talking of. He just made up stories. That's what she believed. So, but she loved the great master. She would come to see him. Something was happening in her, she couldn't explain. Then a strange incident happened. There was a BB there. One of the three BBs, you might have heard stories of three BBs who used to be there, three girls who took care of great masters. They were like serving them, save what, great what they did. One of them at one time, and she was living in a house next to our house in the Dera, to our neighbor. I used to see her all the time. And she locked herself in the room and she didn't open the door for a while. So we had to knock the door open and couldn't find if she's alive or dead. And she looked like she was in a state of meditation. But she had obviously when she went into the, her house, stepped on some what they call good jaggery, some sweet thing. And there was some sweet thing stuck to her heel. And some ants had been crawling and some insects had been crawling and eating up the sweet thing and then ultimately eating up her heel. There was a big wound on the heel and she was still sitting in meditation. So we called the great master to come and see what has happened to her. We tried to wake her up, she wouldn't wake up. So the great master came. She said, he said, call Dr. Shikuntra, send the car and bring her. It's a very serious case. So Dr. Shikuntra came. And she said, Doctor, look at this woman. She's sitting in meditation and she's not even conscious of anything. And her heel is being eaten up by insects and she's not aware of it. She said, Oh, she's in deep coma. Doctor, she take rush her immediately to a big hospital in Lahore or somewhere. The great master said, No, doctor, she is having great time in meditation. She's floating around in astral and causal planes. Doctor said, please, no time for jokes. <laughs> that was a serious case. And the great master said, when there is such deep coma, do the reactions also finish? Or 
do you do these systems still react? She, she took a little hammer of hers and knocked on the joints and the reactions were normal. He said, does it happen anything to the breathing or to the heart and heart beating? Check all the vital signs. Doctor said all vital signs are normal. It's a very unusual case because in such a deep coma, the vital signs are affected. Doc doctor said, how do you explain this? He said, no, this is a case I've not seen in my practice. Please rush immediately, get an ambulance and get her to the hospital. Doctor said, no, no, she will come and tell you that she's having good experience. And he said, BB, can you hear me? She said, yes, open your eyes. She opened her eyes. Where were you? I was roaming around in those higher levels. And that's, on that day, Dr. Shakuntala, love became into a devotion for the master and she accepted him as a master. So sometimes we need different kinds of experiences. It's amazing how I saw different people come to the great master, have totally different experiences to overcome the doubt of the mind. But mind creates doubt, which is, I think is very reasonable to have doubts and skepticism before. I was a great skeptic myself. That's why I can identify with the skeptics. And I know it's very necessary uh, not to be just drawn into anything anybody says and believe it. But examine if the first step is good enough to take. Take the first step. If the second can be seen, then take the second step or withdraw. It's not, this is not something that you are bound to follow. Some people say, is it like a cult or something? Not at all. The cults bind you down to their own group or something. This is not like that. Great Master's message is for the whole humanity. All seekers are equally entitled, no matter where they are. And all seekers are entitled to leave and look for something else if they are not satisfied. It's very different. This is what impressed me a lot when I was initiated by Great Master. His opening sentence at initiation was, What I am going to give you, I got from my Master Baba Jamal Singh. It has worked for me. I hope it will work for you. If it does not, you can find anything else. If you find something better, these are words of great master. If you can find something better, come and tell me also, and I will also go and follow it. The great master's words. It is so open. It's not something confining you to something. It's an experiment. In discovery of your own self, discovery of the nature of creation discovery of your true home, discovery where we belong, discovery of the distinction between the mind and the soul. It's all experimental things and we do it in a very useful way, experiment with it, meditationally, to experience levels of awareness and also the love and devotion that comes is because of the singularity, singularity of the man who is operating from beyond the three, three mental worlds of the physical Causal and Esther. He's operating from outside. It's that love that really pulls us beyond the mind. I'm very happy that you all came to share this Bandara with me. Bandara will be on the 2nd of April. The word Bandara comes from the word Bandar, which means abundance. Bandara means the celebration of abundance. Now, strange thing is, on 2nd of April, 1948, Great Master died. Are we celebrating death of a person? How can we be celebrating as a Bandara the death of a person? Because those who were initiated by him discovered they did not die. That he just left the human form and he's still there with them 24-7. He's more easily accessible to those people after they died than he was before he died. Before he died, we had to go and run to the physical form. And after he died, his disciples had access to his astral radiant form, which was always with them. This is amazing that when a perfect living master initiates us or accepts us, he places his radiant astral form inside us at that very moment and is always with us after that. We don't fully realize because we think we still have the outside physical form of the master to go to, which we did. We ran to him whenever he was available. 
But after that we realized that what he put into us was his real form which is inside us and therefore he never died. Yet his grace comes just by remembering this is the day we realized that he is not only physically there, he is radiantly inwardly with us and therefore we say it's abundance of grace. And I have experienced since 1948 till the 2nd of April last year that on this particular day the grace is so great I can see him blessing, visually see him blessing all those who come here. It's a great experience for me and also I think it's a great experience for those who, who are blessed by him. So that is why I'm very happy that you were able to come here and in two days we'll have the great bandara of abundance, abundance of grace, abundance of blessing that you will get on that day. You're most welcome and I welcome you once again. I'll see you for a little while again in the afternoon. Thank you.